Welcome to uh, our webinar on the future of DeFi. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, my name is uh, Nicholas Schmidt. I'm your host and I'm going to guide you through uh, the next hour or so of this webinar. I'm a partner with Wolf Theis. Wolf Theis is an Austrian law firm. We're based in Vienna. We have offices in the whole CE, SEE area. And uh, we are very interested in all things digital, in particular crypto, but also AI and other topics of this kind. Today we're going to speak about DeFi, about the future of DeFi, and I'm very happy to have a, a great panel here of speakers, uh, speakers representing many different areas of this uh, uh, DeFi space. Uh, I will uh, start by introducing them. So first of all, we have Demelza Hayes. Demelza is the uh, head of research at Cointelegraph. No need to introduce Cointelegraph. This is the leading crypto publication. Uh, the Melzer uh, is heading the research at Cointelegraph. She has a very uh, profound uh, uh, history in crypto. Uh, she has issued uh, 20 reports on various aspects of the crypto space. Uh, she's actually also managing uh, uh, crypto funds. Uh, uh, she's a portfolio manager at Zelt and Co. And the Melzer has been on the Forbes 30 under 30 list, which is uh, a fantastic achievement. And Demelza will be speaking about why DeFi is better than CeFi, why decentralized finance is better than centralized finance, and we'll look a bit at the FTX the, uh, uh, debate room. Then we have UCARP. U is currently not visible. We have a bit of a technical issue here, but he will be visible hopefully soon. Uh, U is uh, an Australian national. He uh, uh, spent 10 years at various life insurance companies. Uh, he was uh, six years uh, the C CFO uh, for Munich Re in the UK uh, until he basically switched to DeFi. So he went from uh, the insurance business and set up his own decentralized finance insurance uh, uh, venture, which is Nexus Mutual. And uh, you will be speaking about uh, the risks in crypto and how to, uh, how to tackle those. Then we have Carl Michael Henneking. So Carl has been uh, a board member in various companies in the telecoms IT consulting uh, uh, area. Uh, he has uh, uh, done a lot of work in, in, uh, in these industries and has uh, at some point come closer to crypto. He's the host of the Untitled Investment Talk, which is a podcast on uh, digital assets and I was at one point uh, his guest at this uh, at this podcast. So Carl Michael will be speaking about smart vaults. Carl is uh, 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 the chief marketing officer of Spool, which is a very interesting project trying to basically uh, bring together the retail market and, and DeFi. And then we have Sydney Powell. So Sydney is uh, the CEO and the co-founder of Maple. Uh, Maple is a, a DeFi application launched in 2021. So as always in DeFi, things are quite young. And Maple is trying to bring together the worlds of traditional finance and decentralized finance. Uh, Sydney has been uh, a treasurer at a commercial uh, company for, for a number of years. So that is, uh, that is the panel. And um, uh, before I sort of... Uh, 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 give a few introductory statements on DeFi, just two housekeeping remarks. The first is for the speakers. Every speaker should limit himself or herself to about 10 minutes or so, uh, so that we have uh, enough time for the questions. And this is the second housekeeping remark. Uh, if you, as, the, as a member of the audience, if you have a question, please put it into the chat. We will collect all the questions and at the end, we will uh, tackle everything that has been raised. So uh, let me just say a very, very, let me just give a very brief introduction into DeFi. What is this? What is decentralized finance? So basically, uh, DeFi is the provision of financial services, but not through central actors, not through banks, insurance companies, mutual funds, and all sorts of other traditional intermediaries, but based on smart contracts, on computer programs running on blockchains. So this is a, a quite a young area. It is one of these smaller areas in crypto, but it has had a very tumultuous uh, few years of history. 
uh, at its peak, $254 billion of value were locked in uh, decentralized finance smart contracts. There's a wide range of applications, and this goes from banks to exchanges to derivative trading desks. So there are lots and lots of things, but also including uh, 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 types of business like insurance business. So um, uh, DeFi is very interesting for millennials. It is very, it fits very uh, much uh, uh, together with their uh, mode of thinking. Everything is super easy. You don't have to fill out forms. You just press one to three buttons and you're ready to go. Uh, you don't have any KYC, AML requirements. You have access daily uh, on a 24 seven basis. You don't have to go to a physical bank branch. Uh, you do everything from your smartphone. So DeFi really is, uh, I would say, uh, uh, in, in touch with uh, how millennials uh, work. DeFi also has a few disadvantages. There are a few risks and uh, we're going to touch upon those. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Uh, and with that, I would like to hand over to Demelza. And Demelza, uh, you are going to uh, explain to us why uh, basically uh, 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 DeFi totally beats CeFi. <laughs> well, thank you for that great introduction uh, to DeFi, Nicholas. And thank you also for uh, the, the kind introduction to who I am. So, Essentially, you know, one of the key differences that uh, exists between centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges is that decentralized exchanges basically have what's called triple entry accounting. And this is enabled by the blockchain technology. So if we just take a look back at the history of accounting and you think about single entry accounting, this was around for thousands of years. It was the first type of accounting we had. It was the simplest kind. And what it did was it just said, you know, I, I could just say at the end of the week, what did I buy? Or at the end of each day, what did I spend money on? And the issue with that is that it's easy to make errors because you don't have your debits and your credits that have to balance at the end. So if you only have one account, a single account of expenses, you you may or may not have accurately uh, written down everything that happened. And you won't know that you, you missed one because you, you don't have a way to balance it with the other side. And then, you know, around the 1400s, we started uh, creating double entry accounting and Italian merchants came up with this system. And a lot of economists and, and, and historians have pointed to the economic benefits that occurred after double entry accounting spread throughout the world. Um, one thing is first, you yourself have a more accurate understanding of your business and your accounts. You also have a better ability to raise capital from the outside world because you can share an accurate uh, uh, perspective of your company with outside investors. And, um, you know, this is kind of what we still use today is double entry accounting with debits and credits. However, there's still a few issues with double entry accounting. One is that accounts can be falsified. And we, we do see this, um, you know, maybe you've heard the saying, they cooked the books, right? And this is something that we see publicly listed companies doing, private companies doing. And so, even though it's better than single entry accounting, it still fails in one key area, which is that it can be falsified and that it's very difficult for outsiders to know if it's been falsified or not. And now this is where Bitcoin, the blockchain technology and decentralized exchanges really, you know, improve upon double entry accounting. Um, and this is with what's kind of referred to as central and central, uh, sorry, triple entry accounting. And what that is, is that essentially in the 1980s, there was a, an economist from Japan uh, named um, Yuji Iriji, Yuji Ijiri. And what he basically said was, if there was a way that we could broadcast our double entries out to everyone and everyone had their own copy of it, and then let's say that all of a sudden I falsified my entries. Well, somebody else in, in that network would have a copy and they'd be able to say, wait, 
my mine's not adding up to the same results that yours is. And so this concept was was kind of around um, in the literature for, for the last, you know, 30 to 40 years. And then blockchain technology really made it a reality. So, you know, to this day, Bitcoin has never been falsified. Um, and, and blockchain technology, if it is de if it is truly a public decentralized uh, ledger that's shared on multiple nodes uh, throughout the world, that is a way to ensure that this 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 network that we share of of debits and credits is properly balanced. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we saw in 2022 essentially was a problem with double entry accounting, right? Because we had exchanges that were cooking their books one way or another, and they faced a lot of problems. We saw multiple bankruptcies, um, Celsius, Voyager, um, uh, you know, FTX, um, some of it was just the way that they were, um, some, some of the way was the way that they were accounting for risk and they were sharing assets with or other um, arms that were part of the organization. Other parts were fraud. So, you know, and the courts are still, you know, doing these cases as we speak. And there's still bankruptcies that are being announced, uh, you know, last week or, yeah, about, yeah, la last week Genesis went into Chapter 11, I think, uh, bankruptcy as well. So, you know, we're still seeing the ramifications of these um, double entry centralized exchanges and custodians. So one question is kind of who are the custodians today and what do their balance sheets look like? What's, you know, are there some ways to to that we can still trust in custodians of centralized exchanges? And, you know, a lot of people have been saying, well, how about we have each custodian like Coinbase or Binance publish their 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 blockchain wallet addresses that they own and we can track how many cryptocurrencies they have and then we can kind of hold them accountable, right, as a, as a, as a as users. So if we see that their wallets are doing odd things like making transfers to other wallets, we can start to withdraw our funds and punish that company. The problem with this is that we don't know their liability side, right? Because their liabilities aren't published on chain. And there's some organ like there's some exchanges like Coinbase, which is publicly listed. So they have to do disclosures every quarter and we can see what their liabilities are and what their um, reserves are, what their asset sides look, what their asset side of their balance sheet looks like. Um, other exchanges like Binance that aren't publicly listed, we can only really go by what they say, what their auditors say, or what um, their on-chain uh, wallets uh, account for. So if we look at that right now, Coinbase actually has uh, the most assets under management of about $111 billion. Um, Their trading volume, though, is uh, relatively low compared to their AUM. That's around $1 billion um per per day so so trading trading volume on january 30th was 1.8 billion us dollars total assets in q3 2021 tw sorry 2022 which is the last time we have their their um publicly listed uh you know their public uh, disclosure was 111 now we have to know uh, you know the price of bitcoin kind of uh, did decrease over q4 um, but then it did it did make a return, so we might be back around 100 billion for Coinbase. Finance on the other side, um, right now, looking at wallet addresses, they're down to 65 uh, billion, which is a lot lower than it was last year. Um, however, their trading volume is 17 billion per day. So even though they have lower assets under management than Coinbase, they actually have you know a 16x higher um, trading volume. Now, talking about what's happened to exchanges as people kind of, you know, lost trust in them. So people started removing their crypto. So over 2022, we saw about half a million Bitcoin leave exchanges. That equates to about 13 billion. Um, if, you, if you look at the amount of outflows per day times it by the price of Bitcoin on that day, that's about 13 billion worth of Bitcoin that was withdrawn in 2022. And this can mean different things. One, it can mean that people are withdrawing their funds to other custodians, 
Um, for example, uh, you know, the, the where, where Zeltner and Co., the fund that I manage, where we keep our assets is with Bitcoin Swiss. Um, and then that wouldn't show up on chain. Um, and there could also be another example where, for example, people are taking custody into their own hands. They're doing self custody with their own hardware wallets. Um, and another observation is that this could mean that there's less sell pressure because there's less cryptocurrencies on the exchanges themselves. So some people are actually bullish about this signal um, that the on chain metrics are showing. So overall, um, I think that 2022, we saw a bit of a, a, a flight to quality custodians. People started to do a lot more due diligence on their custodians. Um, we still face the risk that these custodians have double entry accounting, um, on, unlike the centralized exchanges where everyone can see the, the nodes in the network and, and everyone can see, uh, I mean, every, every node can see the ledgers uh, of these on, on chain uh, exchanges. And um, yeah, effectively, uh, this is kind of the, the picture that we're at. I think that overall, the last uh, in January so far, we have seen less crypto coming off of exchanges. Um, but until, you know, there's more trust again in exchanges, we're probably going to see uh, th this trend uh, kind of uh, go sideways for a bit until we see, um, yeah, essentially uh, more more trust re returning to custodians. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, that's kind of my presentation. And if anyone would like to see more of on-chain analysis, there's uh, Cointelegraph.com. You can go to research.cointelegraph.com. That's that's where all of our reports are. And also, um, if anyone would like to learn more about uh, the Zeltner and Co. Fund for Professional Investors, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, Demelza Hayes. Thank you. Super, thank you very much, Demelza. I, I guess there will be lots and lots of questions uh, from, from the audience. And uh, just as a reminder to everybody, if you have a question, please put into the chat and we'll then uh, uh, deal with all the questions uh, at the end uh, after all the presentations. We will now move on to, to Carl uh, Michael, to Carl Michael. Uh, Carl, let me hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Niklas, also for the um, very precise kind of introduction of what DeFi does. And I'd like to pick that up as well as some of the sorts of the Dementia here. Uh, my topic is smart vault and um, the mass adoption of DeFi. So you already said in the beginning, or I think if, if I just combine uh, your both speeches, so uh, the Melsa was uh, pointing to the fact that with DeFi, um, opposite than CFI, there's much more transparency on which funds are um, uh, moved from X to that. So all is recorded on a blockchain. DeFi also had obviously the advantage that any smart contract which like initiates these moves is also open source. So we have much more transparency in DeFi than CFI. So most of these FTX, Celsius, Voyager, and the other issues definitely wouldn't happen uh, on, a, on a DeFi chain. The other advantages of DeFi you were pointing at, Nicholas, in the beginning is okay. Um, here, both replaces intermediaries like banks, funds, exchanges. All this is decentralized and the protocol takes over um, these things, which means things or transactions can be done much faster, more efficient, and obviously that generates normally higher yields. That's another big benefit of DeFi. Another uh, benefit compared at least to CFI is you can trade 24 seven, or you can lend, you can borrow. All these things you can do 24 seven a week. It's much faster, it's much cheaper, and these services are open to everyone. So DeFi kind of, opens up the whole range of, let's say, financial products, primitives, we know in the Western world, even to more less developed uh, countries, everyone in the end can use DeFi. And moreover, I think the last point which needs to be known about DeFi is that it allows modularity. Modularity means I have one financial service or primitive, I can combine it with another um, financial primitive or service, and I built a new one. 
And that can be done in a few clicks, which is completely unimaginable in, let's say, uh, the TreadFi, the TreadFi world or TreadFi business. So high yields, much more flexibility and much easier and a much easier way to build up own financial products is a key benefits of DeFi. And that's why um, a kind of run on DeFi has started. It has cooled down a bit at the moment, but this run is likely going to continue. And if we kind of beam us up a little bit to, let's say, a 30,000 feet perspective and look at that, and like historically what has happened the last 10 or 20 years in the financial service industry, what kind of revolutions have we seen? We have seen first the introduction of online banking. So kind of you don't go to your, um, to your bank anymore. You do everything online, obviously. The second kind of revolution was, oh, okay, now I have these N26, the Chime, the Trade Republic, everything is mobile. It's much easier from a UI user experience and um, uh, user interface perspective to handle. That massively changed uh, the financial world. New players came up and it's a kind of, what I would say the second stage of revolution. What happens now with DeFi is I would say the third stage of that revolution, but it's not about UI and UX because even the N26, the Chime, the Revolut, Great Republic, they are still relying on that same legacy traditional finance infrastructure, which is not 24 seven, which is not modular, um, which is not open uh, to everyone. So what DeFi in the end does with the help of blockchain uh, technology is opening up a completely new infrastructure stack uh, to the financial to the financial world. And what does it mean in numbers? Assume now you can do all these services on the palm of your hands, on your mobile phone. You can start lending, you can start borrowing. All this kind of paperwork is not necessary uh, anymore. So you can trade 24 seven. This should normally lead to a certain market share, which is currently captured by TreadFi um, markets to go over to DeFi. So let's say overall, I think around 129 trillion US dollars is the global bonds market. And the global stock market is around $122. Let's assume this DeFi revolution takes 2% of this bond market long-term and 1% of the stock market. Then you already see that we are talking about around $4 trillion market opportunity that comes from DeFi. And I think no one can tell obviously when this is gonna happen. Does it take five years, 10 years, even longer? But anyone who is ever kind of, no, almost everyone who is ever engaged with DeFi sees exactly that revolutionary potential of DeFi infrastructure. And once you're in that rabbit hole, and I can tell this of myself, once you're in the rabbit hole, you never get out. And you really understand that this is not about speculation, not necessarily about the price of Bitcoin. Yes, that might be your first entry into this area. But after a while, you really see that a financial infrastructure is, is reinvented. Okay, if this is, if there is a 4 trillion um, US dollar opportunity, why is the uh, DeFi TVL, so total value locked in all these kind of lending protocols and indexes, why was it like only 200 to 250 billion, which was at the peak, um, I think last year. The question here is, is this really as accessible to everyone as we all think? I personally, and I think most of the people who have worked in DeFi will support that at the moment, it's rather difficult to access like two digit yields in DeFi. Why is it difficult? First of all, there are hundreds of different protocols from which you have to choose. Some have higher yields, some have lower yields, some pay the yields out in a native currency, a native coin. You see terminology like V-curve, like bribing, like APY. 
um, sometimes it's very difficult to maneuver on these uh, interfaces. So in the end, it's quite a mess. You need technical knowledge, you need financial knowledge, you need crypto knowledge to really get access to high yields without burning yourself. Because without burning yourself means you can easily get like a 10 or 20% yield somewhere. But the question is what the risk of getting into that yield. So what the DeFi space really needs to unlock that $4 trillion uh, market potential is to have a UX UI, which is really easy to use, and we need to be transparent about risk. And the third thing is about regulation, but I will not tackle the regula regulatory aspect today, but there's a solution for that as, as well. So if we need an easy to use interface and kind of uh, transparency about risk, how, how can this be solved in DeFi? And that is not a vision anymore. I, I take the example of, um, of smart vaults. So we at Spool built such smart vaults, but there are also other companies who build vaults in, in DeFi. Let's take uh, the example of the Spool smart wall and show you what DeFi is already now able to do with a really easy to use uh, interface. I will not use the classical DeFi technology, but I will start maybe with a classical TreadFi language. So a smart wall in its most basic form is something like you can think about an ETF, so exchange traded fund, consisting of, out of bonds, yeah? These bonds uh, generate interest. In DeFi, you would say there are yield sources which generate yield, right? That's the same. So what do you want from such a, an ETF? You ideally want from that ETF, once the principal is paid back or the interest is paid back, you want to auto compound that interest. That is, what smart walls do automatically in DeFi. They auto compound yield. The other thing which you want to do is, okay, I have certain high yield bonds in my portfolio, but what the risk of that? What is the, what is the credit rating of that yield? Okay, in smart walls, you have risk scores, which exactly reflect how much more riskier is it is to invest in yield one, in yield source one, then in yield source two, like credit ratings. Yeah. What do you want from such a financial product now? You want, obviously, when the risk rating changes, because DeFi is a new technology, new industry, risk changes faster than, let's say, in the classical fund market, you want the whole portfolio to automatically rebalance according to risk. That's also what smart worlds can do. So assume you're in a TreadFi world, um, you have a, an, an ETF, and that ETF automatically auto compounds your interest and automatically rebalances according to risk. That's not each and every ETF in the tra traditional world would do that. Now, in DeFi, you not only mirror exactly that experience, but you get some benefits on top. One of the benefits is that out of this fund, if it's, let's say, if it's an ETF of bonds, if you want to sell it next day because you need the money, you have the risk that the price um, of the ETF, the market value of the ETF varies. You're not sure whether you get your principal back, right? That's different with smart vaults and that's different with DeFi. In DeFi, you can withdraw your principal and the interest that you have generated every time, every minute. So in the end, what you see here is a completely new financial product which is an ETF-like representation in the DeFi world, which has the features of a current account. You can withdraw any time. And that is what I meant in the beginning with modularity, the huge power of DeFi infrastructure. You can build such kind of modular services and you can build them as a user with a few clicks. But that's not all. Assume you've built your ETF now, and you become the issuer of an ETF, right? So, because this is like um, coded in a smart contract, you can make the smart contract publicly available. Now everyone can invest in the ETF you have set up and you can collect the performance fee on top of it. So in a few clicks, you have built a fully managed auto-compounding, auto-rebalancing ETF 
it's an own financial product where you immediately can benefit, which you can immediately monetize with performances. And that's not a vision. That's where DeFi or the leading uh, protocols in DeFi are already at now. And this shows why there is maybe even this 4 trillion US dollar estimate might be on the lower end if you see that this infrastructure is so powerful that it likely replaces or is, is very likely to replace a huge part of this legacy traditional finance infrastructure. With that, I don't mean necessarily that TradFi will die. That's not what I think. I think in the end, we will have a, um, a kind of double play between traditional finance and centralized finance, be, uh, decentralized finance, because the TradFi people know not only very well to manage risk, which we now see is also possible in DeFi, but obviously from a perspective of legal compliance, KYC, AML, they are far ahead of the current DeFi industry. But that's not all. So they are now also DeFi protocols tackling this KYC and AML, um, AML angle. And this will allow to build a very solid bridge between TradFi and DeFi. And over this bridge, hopefully, the 4, tri 4 trillion US dollars uh, will flow within 5, 10, or 15 years. I don't know, but I'm quite confident um, that um, this bridge will be used. If you want to know more about um, smart walls, feel free to contact me or anyone else from Spool. My name is Carl Michael Henneking. You find me on LinkedIn. Super. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carl Michael. Uh, we will now uh, hand over to, to Sydney. And uh, Sydney is going to basically speak also about this convergence, maybe uh, between the world of traditional finance and the world of decentralized finance. So over to you, Sydney. And after your presentation, we'll try to patch in you. Uh, so hopefully at that point, you will be, uh, will be reachable. Awesome. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicholas. Uh, pleasure to be here, everyone. So my name is Sid. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Maple Finance. We are a, uh, we're a capital markets infrastructure built on DeFi and built on top of smart contracts. To take a step back though, so my own background was in banking and securitization. So this meant helping lending companies to arrange debt through, uh, through banks and through debt capital markets so they could power their lending business. As I moved on from that, I went and ran the treasury at a commercial equipment leasing company, and this meant being on the client side. So I then saw firsthand how reporting is done, how the tech stack that a lending company uses. I had to work with all the parties that you would in a typical securitization or debt transaction. And so I really saw the challenges of project management, as well as the costs that are involved in, uh, in working with those third parties and how manual the process is. Like it, it's really hard to, to overstate how manual everything is in debt capital markets today. So that brings us forward to what is Maple Finance? So Maple is capital markets infrastructure. It's a way to run a credit fund or a lending business on chain. The core primitive that we have is Maple is this idea of a pool. You can think of that like an SPV or a credit fund, but it's kind of a box that sits on top of blockchain that you can put deposits in and which can send loans out of. So think of it like a, an SPV, it is bankruptcy remote, uh, but like traditional debt capital markets, it has an underwriting team who is associated with it. So this pool has an underwriting team, they're called a delegate and they perform due diligence on borrowers and approve loans. So you can see that it starts to look a lot like private credit or alternative lending markets. So institutional lenders will supply the capital and the funds that are put into the pool, which is like your SPV. And then the underwriting team, which we call a delegate, again, will approve loans to institutional borrowers. Those loans are sent out as a smart contract. So the flow of funds take place, takes place entirely on chain. And then those borrowers will start to make repayments. Now, what's really cool about this is that the original loan that's sent out occurs on chain. You can see all of the terms of that loan. And then every borrower repayment is captured on chain. So it makes it really easy to perform reporting in real time. And it gives you a strong sense of auditability and verifiability about all the transactions that are occurring here. So again, just to recap, the value of doing this on chain is reporting automation 
So you can just run a script that will collect real-time reporting, the automation of payments here. So you can send out a loan and then any repayment that's collected can return interest to the LPs who are sitting in that SPV uh, or in that pool. You have real-time execution of payments. You don't have to wait uh, and manually instruct a bank to send out a, uh, a to disperse a loan. And then you have low cost because you can do this at the click of a button instead of having to pay people to manually run these transactions and pay people for monitoring services. So I think that's really important. Solves a lot of the problems that I encountered running the treasury of a lending business. Now, additionally, uh, the traction that we've had to date was that we launched Maple in May of 2021. Since then, we've done about 1.9 billion in loans. That's been to over 40 different institutional borrowers, and that was spread out across over 200 different loans. Since then, there have been just 45 million in default, so about a deep cumulative net default rate on that um, nearly 2 billion in originations of about 2.3%. It's not bad for institutional working capital loans, but lending is not an entirely new business. So let's look at what this most resembles in DeFi. Now it differs from banking. We saw the early evolutions of DeFi lending and lending on chain looked kind of similar to banking. So you'd have at call deposits, but the issue was asset liability matching. So banks will typically take deposits and originate 30 year mortgages. And that's enabled because of federal government um, insurance of depositors funds. But we don't have that here. This is entirely private sector phenomenon. At the other end of the spectrum, you saw, uh, you've seen comparisons to P2P lending. Again, this is quite different from what's occurred in P2P lending in the, in the past because that aims to crowdsource retail deposits to fund loans. Whereas in this case, it's mostly an institutional phenomenon. And also what you're syndicating is not each uh, loan, you're actually syndicating a pool of capital. And so what that provides for borrowers, importantly, like very importantly, is certainty of execution and speed. So they can have a conversation with an underwriting team who can tell them how much inventory or how much capital they have available to lend and negotiate terms. They don't have to put out an offer to the broader market and see what comes back, which is one of the big pain points for early P2P ventures like Lending Club. So what is this actually closest to in the, in the world of traditional finance? Private credit, direct lending, CLOs, and BDCs. So names like Aries, Apollo, Golden Tree, these are the closest comparables that I look at. Uh, so they take outside capital into vehicles, which are separate from each other. They then underwrite borrowers and approve loans and keep a fee for providing this service. Let's go back and compare that to what's happening on Maple. So a credit underwriter sets up a pool, institutional asset managers deposit funds into it. The underwriter due diligence is borrowers and then sends out loans from it and keeps a fee for performing that service. The performance of loans in one pool are segregated from the performance of loans in a different one. It's kind of like bankruptcy remote, but using technology instead of bankruptcy remote being constructed just through legal artifice. But for new technology to break through, you ultimately have to do something either better, faster, or cheaper than the existing way of doing things. So what does on-chain lending offer? Well, to win in lending, you either need to lend at a higher rate, lower your cost of funds, lose less to impairments and fraud, or spend less on operations. In my view, lending on, lending on blockchain is often positioned as a play on credit risk management, but I actually see it as much more of a play on spending less on operations and having faster execution and processes because of that ability to automate smart contracts. So you can imagine, um, as just a historical example of something that we saw, uh, there was a pool that was operating on the platform in 2022. Uh, it was uh, run by a good team of credit analysts um, but the trading firm, the parent trading firm of that team uh, suffered losses in trading and went into liquidation. But the advantages are, and this really illustrates the merits of doing this on chain and using smart contracts, are that anyone who was depositing into the pool that had been run by that firm could see who all of the borrowers were in real time, all of the performance of those loans in real time, and then smart contracts. And this is really important because it gets to that point around bankruptcy remoteness. The smart contracts of that pool of loans continued to process withdrawals and depositors received 100 cents in the dollar back, even as the trading firm that uh, had been affiliated with that pool and had been doing the underwriting suffered an insolvency in the trading arm of that business and subsequently went into liquidation. So you can see that the smart contract enabled depositors to avoid the commingling risk and the counterparty risk of that trading firm, which I think is very important 
and they could always see in real time the performance of that entire loan book and where the repayments were going just by viewing the blockchain. Uh, so that's really important. You can also see that in future applications, so one of the things I look at a lot in, in traditional finance is CLOs. And now they will have triggers around concentration, default rate, and these are all things that could be automated into uh, smart contract lending, into the lending contract um, that is operating these pools. So you could have a trigger where if defaults exceed a certain percentage of the overall assets of the pool, new loans cannot be originated, cash is collected, and then could be swept to people who are depositing in the pool. And that would execute in real time instead of requiring uh, an end of the month uh, notification from a CLO administrator. So I think broadly, these are applications that we will start to see utilized by more institutional investors because it ultimately helps manage risk and reduce counterparty risk. Now, no discussion on the space would be complete without just touching on regulation. Uh, so I won't go into too much depth, but does a platform like this need to be regulated? This is a continual um, debate between uh, whether it is technology and our position is that no, this is ultimately a technology system that is being used to operate a lending business. It doesn't determine who can borrow, nor does the, uh, nor does the platform itself custody funds. They're always held in smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. Now, many Web2 fintechs will use loan management systems. A good one, uh, as an example, is Mambu out of Europe, but that software itself is not regulated. It is the lending businesses themselves that are subject to regulation. A good example within the digital asset space would be Firebox. So this is uh, producing technology that runs wallets, but it is, it, it is itself not regulated as a custodian, despite custodians using it as infrastructure. BNY Mellon as a, uh, as a good example. Are the loans themselves securities? The test that people will often look to is the family resemblance test under Reeves. And in what occurs uh, in DeFi lending, it's typically the answer is no. Uh, loan, these would be structured like a loan. They're for a specific business purpose, generally the depositors of sophisticated lenders. And the language used is also um, more akin to lending, interest rates rather than investments and returns, which was something that would um, cited in recent cases with uh, with the CFI lenders. And then finally, are the pools themselves securities? This is still um, uh, still unclear from a regulatory perspective, but what we've found is that operators who are uh, running them uh, say no, again, for the family resemblance test, but often they will hedge by running them uh, in a format that is in agreement with Reg D or Reg S, so Reg S being uh, foreign offshore, uh, issuance, Reg D being accredited investors um, and non-transferable deposits. What we've found is there has been a push now more towards KYC deposits and what you would call permissioned DeFi. So this enables institutions to participate because they're not, uh, they're not at risk of taking funds from non-KYC or non-AML entities. And I think uh, that has been a trend that we've seen more institutions now willing to participate when they can get comfortable with that side of things. So finally, we've taken stock of the current state of the industry, but how does DeFi lending evolve from here and how will on-chain capital markets evolve from here? So the initial wedge was lending to market makers and trading firms. This was in the very beginning over collateralized. And then as the market grew and as competition to lend grew, this evolved to uncollateralized working capital loans. This ended up problematic because you could see correlations with the broader market, even though most borrowers would, would maintain delta neutral strategies. We ultimately saw the biggest risks were typically operational risks, uh, most prominently with uh, on display with FTX, where if you had lent to a borrower who had held deposits on FTX, that exposed you to, uh, to risk there. Now what we've seen this year is more of an evolution towards over collateralized lending with real world assets. So real world assets being used as collateral to borrow uh, on chain. I think this is gonna be the big trend for 2023. We ourselves, Maple, just launched a pool last week, which was financing tax credit receivables. So uh, small businesses that were impacted by COVID were eligible for IRS rebates. And then uh, there was a niche underwriter or originator who would purchase those to so do factoring of those receivables. So this is the first major example we've seen of real world asset lending done on chain. We're very proud of this. We think it'll be a trend that continues. And we're now looking at things uh, like reinsurance financing on top of that. But what this required to get to this point was 
uh, investment in complex legal agreements, securities packages and filings. Uh, but ultimately, uh, now that technology is in place, it is something that can be expanded. So hey, thank you for your time. I'll pop a link to, uh, to Maple Finance website uh, at the bottom um, in the chat. And uh, if anyone has uh, any questions, of course, feel free to reach out to me. Thanks so much. Super. Thank you very much, Sydney. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, we will move on to you, Cobb, now. And uh, I hope that we will get a video feed of you. Okay, here he is. Uh, you, can you hear us? I can hear you. Hope you can all hear me and see me now. <laughs> Fantastic. It would have been bizarre if we do this presentation on like a uh, DeFi, very technical thing, and then we don't manage to get you here by video. Okay, but finally we managed. So uh, you, the, the the floor is yours. Cool. No, thank you very much. Um, great to be here. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of run you through what um, I see in the kind of risk environment in DeFi um, and what, what's what we kind of what. I see happening in the in the future, and I guess one of the key reasons I think this is obviously a very important topic is that if we're going to get scalability within um, the DeFi ecosystem and it, for it to become the financial rails that I, I believe a lot of us um, think it can become, then you really need to get that security right. Um, and like it, with if the serious mass market is to come, whether that's institutions or mass market retail, they need to be um, using these platforms and they need to be um, secure underneath. Um, and so that's kind of, I believe, a fundamental um, part of um, increasing adoption into that mass, mass market and I guess crossing the chasm rather than just kind of um, the high risk, um, like risk on people um, getting involved, which is basically the, the people that are involved at the moment. Um, and so that's kind of um, that's kind of the theme of what I'm talking about here. I guess very quickly, if the answer to the question is I think they can be tamed. I, I think the risks um, in crypto can be tamed. I think that we'll go through a bunch of cycles um, and things will get better after each cycle. Um, I, and to kind of go back right to to the start, um, one of the the kind of founding. Um, I guess big risks that are that arose pretty early on in the Ethereum ecosystem in 2016 um, was smart contract risk, and um, the DAO um, being um, being a you know a, a collective when people were pulling money and and then kind of um, investing in other projects. Um, it had a bug and basically the the pool of money got um, got stolen and it eventually led to kind of a. A, um, a fork of the Ethereum network, and and kind of that was kind of a bit of a, a huge moment that um, yeah you, you can trust smart contracts to operate as they have been coded, but what if they are coded incorrectly? Um, and so that's kind of what well, um, that's what Nexus Mutual was kind of um, found for to kind of protect against those types of risks to provide um, coverage for those types of events. Um, but more from a risk point of view, um, the actual if you have a look at the technical details of what actually caused that event, it was effectively a, it's what's called a re-entrancy bug. And now if you have a look at all of the smart contracts that are developed, then it'd be very poor practice for someone to find an effectively a re-entrancy bug like, um, like that exists um, in, in the DAO. Um, and, there's a lot of tooling. The security auditors would look um, look at that first to be one of the top things on their list, and so that's just a good example of a key risk that has now, I think, been ma being managed quite well throughout the industry. And there's a lot of different risks that are kind of going through that cycle where they kind of get discovered, um, and then the tooling and the um, the knowledge spreads throughout um, the industry, and then things get improved. It's kind of like, I guess, the aviation industry in the early 1900s where you had lots of crashes and 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 people just taking um, risks and they were kind of the adventurers going out um, using this new technology. Um, and then as time went by, you introduced standards standards, um, you introduced more skills, and you introduced, um, I guess, legal frameworks around things as well to kind of, um, under, people can understand where the boundaries were, um, and then they could um, they could enter this new, um, I guess, industry. And, and the same type of thing with DeFi. And so, I guess in terms of the kind of key risks that I see happening uh, in, the, in the future, um, uh, that I'm keeping an eye on in terms of the emerging type category. Uh, one is cross-chain bridges and protocols. Um, there's been a lot of um, big hacks of, of bridges um, recently, like the wormhole one, the Ronin one, um, multiple hundreds of millions on those. Um, and so that's kind of a, a big risk. And it's it's really 
caused by like a centralization type of risk in a lot of the cases. Like you've got a multi-sig or a single point of failure at one point. Basically, it becomes a honeypot for hackers. So because a lot of the money gets stored in one place. So that's something to keep an eye on. Again, I think it, the risks can be overcome and, and tamed, but um, but there's there's a bit of work to be done there. Um, the second category um, that I look at is um, layer two type solutions. And there's like lots of growing adoption here, whether it's um, optimistic type rollups or zero knowledge type rollups, and you don't need to go into the details of the differences there, but um, there's different types. Um, and I guess at the moment, the there's layer two growth happening, um, but I would say that we it's, it hasn't really grown yet, and there are still kind of um, key assumptions or things that haven't been fully tested in live environments there yet. Um, and some of those would be like the exit games um, with, um, with the um, the layer twos and how, and how you get money out when um, when things um, potentially go bad and making sure those guarantees happen, um, so that that's something to to keep an eye on. Again, I think it's improving, but um, it's something we're keeping an, keeping an eye on. Another one which is really interesting and um, kind of highlights the the double edged sort of um, DeFi in some ways. Um, DeFi is one of its kind of superpowers is its composability, and that means that one project can build on top of another project without um, the first project actually knowing you're doing it or giving permission or anything like that. You can just simply use the code. It's open source. You can integrate with it as you wish. Now, that's fantastic. But the downside there is that you have this, it, it creates risk. So I, I call it like the integration or interface type risk because a lot of people building the second system aren't necessarily experts in the underlying system and they may make some assumptions that the, the underlying system always works in a certain way or the data that it's getting feeding it back um, should be treated in a certain way and they, maybe they miss an edge case because they're not the experts. Um, and so therefore they um, their, their system doesn't work or can be drained of funds, et cetera. So, and that's probably um, a very interesting one because it's kind of the fault, the faulty integrations is basically the leading vulnerability disclosure type on Immunify, which is like a, a bug bounty um, platform. Um, and so this, this is a this is a key one that um, that I think it's it's always going to be there because it's very human um, in, in there's human involvement all the time about interpreting and things. But um, it, it will get better, and the the tooling and stuff will get better, and the underlying and the understanding of the underlying protocols and all their edge cases will also get better. Um, the last one, which is a bit of an interesting one that um, to talk about actually, is is decentralized governance. And so one of the things is you can you can have a perfectly good um, DeFi protocol um, that's been out there for ages. Um, but it can also have the ability to upgrade itself via governance. And as soon as you upgrade it, then it potentially um, loses its battle-tested nature and kind of has to start again in some ways. Um, or you could, um, or you could use accidentally by, by accidentally introducing a bug. Um, and so you know that's kind of a, a natural one. But you you would hope that lots of the audits and all that process will be followed, and and um, and generally that does happen. Um, but but also there's a potential for the tragedy of the commons here where you're in a DAO and everyone's thinking that someone else has looked at this and assumed that some, um, that there's been proper due diligence on it, but maybe that hasn't actually happened. Um, and so they vote it through, et cetera. And so there, there are some, um, there are some potential issues um, there that need to be, um, you need to be aware of, I guess. Um, Compound was a good example with that one that they actually accidentally introduced a bug um, with a proposal and then they couldn't fix it for seven days um, because there was a the governance um, process um, has a seven day lock on it. So, um, so this this does happen. It has happened in the wild. Was, that one wasn't a big loss, um, but um, but it's something to to be aware of. So those are kind of the key four key areas that um, that I'm keeping my eye on. I guess from from my perspective and I guess more more broadly like Nexus, um, our our goal is to um, we we note, note that you can't actually get rid of all risk entirely. Um, we want to minimize it as much as possible um, and and avoid it in in, all ca in you know as many cases as you can. Um, but then there's always going to be a, a layer of risk that um, you want to offload. You know either to um, and you know Nexus is there for to kind of prevent um, to be the backstop if if the risk does eventuate. So we you know cover things like smart contract risk. We're also um, launching slashing risk for Ethereum and and others as well. So um, so yeah check check. Check out Nexus Mutual if you um, want to have a look. We've got a big V2 upgrade coming in the in, in the next few weeks, so um, lots of things happening um, with us right now. But um, overall, risks are there. They're in DeFi. They'll keep um, evolving and changing. But I think the direction of travel is positive, and we will be able to to tame them and um, enable mass adoption to to come through. So yeah, thank you.
Super. Thank you very much, you, for your run through uh, to the different types of risks. Uh, uh, we just have a few minutes left and uh, quite a number of, of questions from the audience to answer. Let me uh, try to summarize and, and to shoot out questions to, to each of you. Uh, if you would basically answer just in, in a few sentences so that we that we can uh, uh, tackle all of these uh, questions that, that we have uh, received. So the first of the first one would be to the Meltzer. Uh, the Meltzer uh, crypto has many different sort of areas. I mean, there there is DeFi, there are DAOs, there are NFTs, there are all sorts of of, of things happening. Uh, that all of these groups have their sort of uh, uh, Telegram groups and on Twitter and have their sort of uh, th these are basically tribes. But uh, would you agree with the statement that DeFi is the killer app of crypto or not and why? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I mean, if you count. So for me, decentralized finance means that I own my keys and I have basically a bearer asset. It's either a bearer asset that represents uh, currency or, or, or medium of exchange. It's a bearer asset that represents a stock. It's a bearer asset that represents a bond, but it means that I have my keys and I can control my assets. And if that's what you mean by DeFi, then I do believe that DeFi is the killer app of, of, of the blockchain technology. Um, because, you know, I think that, uh, that's what people want. They want, you know, the ability to, to, to store their, their surplus capital from, from today till tomorrow when there's a future, when there's a rainy day in the future and they want to be able to have access to that. So yeah, I, I would agree that DeFi is, is the killer app of, of blockchain technology. Super. Okay. Next question is for, for Carl Michael. Uh, Carl Michael, uh, you mentioned, you call it modularity. Some people speak of composability or even money Lego. The fact that you can put together DeFi protocols, uh, you can build these DeFi protocols on top of each other. Uh, you can sort of build these huge pyramids. And uh, obviously that is, a, that is something you cannot do in traditional finance. Uh, it is possible in certain cases, but very complicated. You need always the consent of the other party. You need to fill out uh, uh, paper forms and so on, but you cannot do it in an automated manner. And uh, Carl Michael, you mentioned that this is sort of one of the uh, really big advantages. And Spool is actually exactly that. Uh, it is uh, an, a money Lego application building on top of other protocols. Now, uh, uh, interestingly, you mentioned uh, something about uh, uh, sort of this is this can also be dangerous because you have these app, DeFi apps that are being built by teams, very dedicated, very hardworking. But they they make certain assumptions about how these protocols are going to be used, and then a protocol ends up in a stack of many different layers, and uh, these assumptions are then broken, and something bad happens, which will negatively impact on uh, on the uh, uh, basically people supplying capital, for example, to Nexus Mutual. Now, now, Carl Michael, what is your view on 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 this? I mean, is composability or is modularity uh, the term that you use? Is this sort of, um, I mean, is this really sort of only a benefit, or do you agree that there can be there can be risks from this building on top of of each other? No, that's absolutely correct. Um, every benefit has a certain trade-off you have to live with, right? So if you stack like ten protocols on top of each other, and one uh, one in that chain breaks, right, you have a problem if you are on top of that stack. Um, that's without question um, a kind of drawback. Well, how we uh, tackle this at Spool is, is quite easy, right? So first of all, the stacks below us, we really look at what what is it, right? On 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 uh, what stacks are we building? So if you build on Ethereum, you are this maybe uh, the best smart contract chain out there. If you use protocols like Aave and Compound at these sources, they are also very well proven. And um, we develop risk scores for each of these uh, protocols. And one layer or one factor in these risk scores is also how many um, layers these protocols are using to produce their yield, right? And the more layer they use, the higher our risk score is. So every user in Spool would immediately see what kind of risk he's taking through modularity. Ourselves, maybe we are in the on stack three here in this modularity chain, 
we have like a, a huge bug bounty program running 1.5 million. Um, we have really the best smart contract auditors and not one, but a couple of them auditing our protocol. So we spend a couple of um, hundred thousand dollars on, on that alone, right? Which gives at least our users, um, yeah, it's a kind of comfort um, to go with uh, to go with Spool, right? That's not necessarily the case with each and every protocol, especially if teenagers have have built their own thing, which is not the case for Spool, fortunately. Yeah, I, I think this is a common thread for for this panel because what we wanted to show is that these are not only they're not only these like twenty year olds building a DeFi app which collects uh, several billion dollars in in a week. Uh, and uh, only degenerates playing on on these platforms, but they are like serious people, like Carl Michel and and Sydney, for example, uh, with a serious finance background, entering this and trying to replicate what they have been doing in the past. So so uh, thank you very much uh, for your contribution. Before we move to the next question, just for the audience here on the slide, I hope you can see uh, see this. Uh, we are planning uh, other webinars. We're doing two deep dives, one into NFTs. Okay, uh, and one into DeFi, and there's also the, the Wolf Dice Crypto Academy, which is this like 20 hour course I've been teaching for many, uh, many years now. Uh, I have more than 1000, I had more than 1000 participants in, in all of these years. So if you have zero idea about this, this topic of, of crypto and DeFi, then this could be something for you. Now, let's, uh, let's move on to Sydney. Uh, Sydney, uh, uh, you said, uh, and I'm quoting you here that uh, basically what, what you are sort of um, benefiting from, but what Maple is benefiting from uh, is, is basically the automation, that things go faster, that there's reporting, automatic reporting, that uh, things are cheaper uh, because there's no human element involved. Uh, my question to you, very sort of high level question, but would you, would you think that this has somehow, this will somehow exert pressure on the world of traditional finance? I mean, if, 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 there, if there's a group of people doing things faster with automatic reporting and cheaper, uh, that, that should some that should have you should be able to make inroads into the into the uh, into, into your, the world of your competitors. How do you see things? Is this sort of is there going to be uh, a, a non-negligible effect on the world of traditional finance? Or what what is your view? Yeah, I, th I, I think of course. Uh, so if I like if, if 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 you break if you break down what goes into the interest rate that might be offered to an institutional borrower, so let's say let's say let's say Aries and Maple are competing to bid to provide the finance for a massive you know one billion dollar construction project. So in that interest rate is going to be a cost of funds, mm -hmm. an operational cost, an allowance for bad and doubtful debts. Uh, and uh, that will be the final interest rate that is, and then a premium for liquidity. And that'll be the final interest rate that's charged to the borrower. If we have a lower operating cost because we can automate reporting, uh, reconciliation of payments, and uh, you know passing back interest to uh, to LPs, then we could either charge the same interest rate as Aries and reap a higher either reap a higher profit ourselves or pass back a higher interest rate to the underlying LPs, or we could outbid them with a lower interest rate, but still reap the same profit uh, as, as a ranger and pass back the same amount to, uh, to the LPs who ultimately financed it. So I think that will just, like that competition for, uh, for profits and on prices will just naturally lead to the adoption of this type of technology. Yeah, super. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sydney. Uh, uh, I'm trying to sort of summarize all of the remaining questions uh, because we're already five minutes overdue. Uh, I would ask uh, everybody who has uh, a question that is unanswered to maybe reach out directly to the uh, to the uh, panelists or to myself alternatively, and I can pass it on. Uh, but let me just sort of summarize uh, three questions into one. Uh, and that is, uh, I would say, what, what is the state of regulation of DeFi in the US and in Europe? Uh, what is coming? Uh, what does Mika mean? And can you uh, uh, can you sort of capture uh, DeFi at all? So uh, just sort of in, in one sentence, uh, 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 DeFi and regulation, uh, um, uh, basically there's nothing in Europe yet, uh, uh, nothing specifically targeted at DeFi. 
there, there's of course uh, the, the the fifth uh, anti-money laundering directive or the revision of the fourth AMLD as it is called, which contains uh, rules against uh, uh, rules uh, uh, covering anti-money laundering and and KYC. Uh, there is Mika coming in, but it will probably be only uh, uh, officially passed in the first quarter of 2023 and will take several months until it enters into force. But Mika will anyway not really cover uh, DeFi, it will cover certain crypto asset service providers. And it is doubtful whether whether uh, uh, crypto will be, whether DeFi will be covered uh, under these rules. Uh, there's already, uh, uh, there are already people speaking about Mika 2.0, which will address DeFi, but that is very much uh, on the uh, very much they're very far away still um, uh, in the U.S. I'm not from the U.S. I cannot speak for the U.S. Uh, but my uh, uh, what, what I gather from reading, for example, on Coin Telegraph, uh, is that uh, uh, things are a lot more unsettled actually in the U.S. than in Europe, and it will take even longer uh, for some concrete policy to be to be developed. So uh, uh, th that's it uh, uh, for today. So I would like to thank. First of all, the panelists for the expertise for being available uh, for this webinar, uh, for sharing their insights. I would like to also thank the audience. Uh, thank you for your patience and for listening through this uh, one hour and seven minutes. Sorry for the slight glitch at the beginning when my microphone was turned off. Uh, but uh, at any rate, we, we sort of managed uh, uh, the presentation. And uh, if you're interested in this topic of crypto, then feel free to to join our other webinars, you can read more uh, the exact details. Uh, you, you can find them uh, shortly on our uh, company's uh, uh, LinkedIn page. So thank you very much and, and have a great uh, rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.